The start was about in the middle of the day as we went up north in the bay, and it was a beautiful day, it turned into a beautiful evening. Breeze out of the south, spinnaker up, going fast. So it was a beautiful race night for us, and everything was going just the way we wanted it to go. I mean, it was 15 knots of breeze, warm, nice on deck. Nothing in the cards really suggested that the breeze increase that we got over uh, that half an hour, 45 minutes or whatever was supposed to come. When it went from a pleasant 15 knots to a not so pleasant 40 knots, it caught us with our pants down basically. And uh, that's when things got a little out of control. We heard a little bit of velocity increase down below, which you can tell the boat is going faster and the wind is picking up. So we had an idea that something was going on. And then we both heard the stomping of the feet, which is basically an all hands on deck signal to come get the sails down and get the boat under control. And at that point, Mark and I both went up topside. I had all my gear on, but I needed to put my life jacket on. And my life jacket I put on, but I had a hard time buckling it. So I tried two or three times and it didn't get it buckled, but I just felt like the urgency needed me on deck. And uh, so I scrambled up on deck without it buckled. The boat was at its limit of control, and I was um, steering furiously to try to keep the boat underneath the spinnaker. Because if you don't, then you wipe out and the boat crashes. So my position of the boat is aft, either on the helm or uh, helping out in the navigation end of it. And uh, when I went up, I went all the way out to the back of the boat. And as I reached over for the winch, there was a lot of motion on the helm, and I was flung over the side. As soon as I got within a foot of the mast, not very far, only two or three steps, is when I heard the man overboard call. Two other crew members who had come on deck uh, saw him go over the side and called man overboard. And frankly, I, I, I couldn't believe it. So when I went in the water, the first priority in my mind was to get my life jacket inflated, which had a cylinder in it, but it was not in the automatic mode. So I had to reach inside my Velcro, a life jacket, find the lanyard and pull the lanyard to activate my life jacket. I am quite confident that if I didn't get that inflated, I would have drowned in the first 10 minutes. The second thing I did after I got my life jacket inflated was grab my uh, light and hold it up in the air so they could see that I had gone through that first evolution successfully. And the guys in the boat did see the light. Basically, the only thoughts going through my head at that point were get to the sail, get to the takedown line, and let's get it in the boat as fast as possible. So as the boat is traveling 18 to 22 knots at this point, you know, it's covering a mile every few minutes. And by the time we had the operation to get the sail down, we had covered probably two miles. The breeze had increased significantly, up touching on 50 to 55 knots probably, and the boat heeled over and was pinned on its side. We were held down approximately you know, a minute to a minute and a half, up to maybe even two minutes. It was hard to tell time at the time. You don't know really how far you've drifted when you're lying on your side trying to get the boat turned around going back the other way. It was the classic case of a string of small disasters. I didn't have a chance to really think about how serious the situation was. I knew, though, that the boat was leaving at 18 knots and the wind was increasing and it was going to be a long time before they were able to come back and I pulled my gear out and saw what I had in my life jacket, which was a uh, AIS transmitter, a knife, a life jacket, and a whistle. So I started blowing the whistle a little bit and uh, holding the light up, but the light, which was a brand new light with brand new batteries, failed. I mean, the key thing is we still thought we saw the light. We had two people watching the whole time, and so that was the first direction we went. The first light we kind of went towards, we realized after a while was moving and it wasn't him. And then, well, if not that light, maybe it's the light over there. And no, that's not that light either. So we probably spent, you know, a good 15 minutes chasing lights that were just ghosts. And we formulated the best search plan was to head back straight where we came from and try and retrace our steps to get back where we were. Once you get into it and you start heading back that way is when you have time and space in your brain for all the thoughts to creep in. And when you start doing the math of, you know, the chances of success, they're very, very small. Keeping positive and focused in that situation is very, very difficult because you just feel a crushing weight of impossibility basically pushing down on you. I had no illusion that they would be back in the near future. My job was surviving and that's what I concentrated on. I was worried about going unconscious as the night went on and falling out of my life jacket. I tried several times to buckle that life jacket, but I couldn't get it done. So I had to hold the two lobes basically together around with my arms. At that point, 
was thinking about family and things like that. I had kept a whistle in my mouth and I was blowing it under every breath. Every once in a while water would get into the whistle and muffle it, but almost every breath it would be blowing as hard as it could. Somebody said, I think I hear a whistle. I said, you don't hear a whistle. You can't hear a whistle out here. It's loud. It's windy. It's stuff's flapping and crashing and banging around. Then we started to listen for it by knocking the motor back so we could hear. And, and then, sure enough, a couple of us began to start to hear it. And then we sort of had a vague idea of where it was. And so we started kind of, we'd head that way for a little bit. And then we'd kill the engine. And then we'd listen some more. and. I, I think that's a whistle. That was finally hope. I saw the light off in the distance and I started blowing that whistle as hard as I could. So as we approached the area that we were really humming in on Mark's whistle, another boat was coming up and they actually were able to put a spotlight on Mark. And when he was illuminated, then we really knew that we were gonna get him back at that point. When the two boats were converging, Aftershock and Meridian, I kept blowing the whistle because that's all I could do. With all the gear on, boots and follow weather gear, there was no swimming even a few yards. It's tricky to pull a boat alongside somebody in the water, but if you treat it as if you were sailing up to that person, that's usually the best way. And so we basically sailed up to a mooring effectively, and Mark was the mooring. Once I was able to get my hands on Mark physically, it was an overwhelming relief. It was like a flood that just washed over. And you know, the first thing to do was get him on the boat and get him warmed up once, he, once we had him. Um, but the actual moment we got him onto the boat was probably the the biggest relief I've ever felt in my life. I was told once I got on board uh, and I was lying flat on my uh, face on the floor that I said, that was close, that was close. And it was very close. Without a life jacket, he would not have lived. Without the whistle and without the searchlights, we would not have pulled it off. There was no chance we would have seen him without the whistle and lights in those conditions. It was pitch black. I have two whistles. My new life jacket has the original whistle that saved my life and I have another whistle. This past summer, we went back and did the race again. So we got back on our horse, and it was a miserable race too. <laughs> but we went and did it, and so we crossed that one. But no, I think that uh, if anything, it strengthened the bond on our team and, and definitely in our trust in each other. <laughs>